know, because we got other projects that God is working on right now. We're trying to get the um, Black Cabinet Google exhibit done. Some of the John Doerr. We, I don't know. We have the content. We just don't have the website up yet. Mm -hmm. The technology part. Of course, I chipped my nail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you got to reset your password. seem to miss her cue. <laughs> I can feel it. She's like flapping her arms really loud. Welcome to the National Archives Know Your Records program. We are broadcasting live from the National Archives building in Washington, D.C. with a live on-site audience as well as you folks who are watching us online on YouTube. We're so pleased that you have joined us today. Before we begin, I have a few tips for you. For those of you here joining us on site, when we're ready for questions at the end of the program, please use the microphones that are found in the aisles. For those of you who are watching online, you can also submit your questions by using the chat feature here on this web page. You'll also find several captioning, you'll, I'm sorry, you'll also find several links. One is to live captioning. You'll find a handout link and presentation slides link. And you can download those to your pleasure. For today's presentation, Tina Lagan will discuss records relating to desegregation, integration, and studies on black education. She will cover the Brown versus Board of Education case, the Little Rock Nine crisis, research activities at historically black colleges and universities, and busing in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Boston, Massachusetts. Tina Lagan is an archivist at the Textual Processing Division at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, and a PhD in African American History. And now for our presentation on the role of the federal government in black education. Please join me in welcoming our presenter, Dr. Tina Lagan. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, first, I'd like to say good afternoon to those of you who are here, and also good afternoon to those of you who are watching via YouTube. Um, just a little background about this presentation. It's 
part of the um, Black History Guide that we, will, we are in the process of developing that will be available to the public soon. Um, and this is just one of the subject areas that as I was working on various records, I just noticed different patterns and different types of records that we have relating to um, the role of the federal government in black education. Um, this presentation is just basically to give an ideal or a brief overview of how the federal government um, affects um, black education, um, either in the positive or in the negative. We're gonna look at various record groups, various case studies or very instances where you have to see the federal government stepping in and taking a role to um, either assist uh, with black education from the 19th century, even into the 21st century. So just a little background information about the presentation. Oops, am I going the right way? It's not working. There we go, okay. First slide. Okay. Technical difficulties. All right. So just a little background in information about um, black education in America. Um, African Americans have had a long struggle for quality education um, in America. The, during the first part of the 19th century, you do see in many of the northern states where uh, northern blacks tried to find ways to educate their children. Most of these schools where they were educated were private, church functioned, um, and many of them were in bad shape, uh, low quality, um, lack of funding, and in many cases, you know, a lack of students um, due to various reasons. Um, excuse me. And after the Civil War in the later half of the 19th century, you do start to see the federal government taking a larger role in black education, primarily in the South. Uh, the Freedmen's Bureau Schools, which I'll talk about in a little bit later, um, was there to provide all men, women, and children some form of basic education, uh, reading, writing, arithmetic uh, for most of these people. Towards the later part of the 19th century and going into the 20th century, you do start to see a growth in segregated education. Um, many places in the South where it was mandated by law, and even in the North where it's kind of by custom. A lot of these segregated schools, uh, the black schools would also suffer. Um, again, similar situation, lack of funding, the quality of the education, um, the number of students enrolled. Now, I will you know, admit that there were some exceptions to this rule. Um, one particular case study that I actually did my dissertation work on was the Harriet Beecher Stowe in Cincinnati, which was a publicly funded school, self-segregated school, that was actually very well funded, and you have teachers um, teaching K through, 12, eight, K through eight classes with bachelor's and even master's degrees. So just the various types of records that we have here at the National Archives in the D.C. area and even in some of the regional archives, um, most of the records pertaining to education or black education can be found in textual form. We do have some photographic images of students in these schools. Special media, um, I'll talk about some of the recordings that we have of people discussing um, situations relating to black education. And then now we're getting a lot of data, a lot of statistical work um, in electronic records form with this. Okay. So just a general overview of the types of record groups or where you can find this information if you are doing research within this topic. The largest record group where you would find information would be RG12, uh, Records of the Office of Education. Um, these were, this, this agent's particular agency collected, disseminated information concerning education in the United States and abroad, as well as promoted improved educational practices through financial assistance, special studies, and programs. Selected series within this record group will include correspondence, 
photographs, various types of pro uh, publications, reports, research um, data, and even um, information about the schools in the Washington, D.C. area. It's been a while since I looked at this PowerPoint. Oh. Go back. Okay. Some select um, series in this record group, RG12, that might be of interest. You do have the historical files, which contains a lot of correspondence between Booker T. Washington of Tuskegee Institute and W.T. Harris, who was the commissioner of the Bureau of Education. They were writing back and forth about various forms of vocational education, programs, classes, what the students were doing at the Tuskegee Institute, as well as information about agricultural, um, agricultural and industrial type training between the federal government and Tuskegee Institute. So you will see in these correspondences um, how the federal government actually took an interest in what black students were learning at Tuskegee. And also you can see Booker T. Washington looking for means um, as ways to kind of help fund or support these various programs. You also have the series uh, State Files Relating to Vocational Education. Um, in the 19th, late 19th, early 20th century, you do see a stronger push towards vocational training, uh, especially with Booker T. Washington taking the lead on vocational education. Uh, the federal government is also playing a role into finding in the South, various uh, segregated schools to provide vocational training, and even offering some of the schools in the North funding or special assistance to encourage more vocational training. You also have the central files in RG12. This contains a lot of information about the employment of black teachers, uh, statistical data such as where they went to school, where they're from, how much they're getting paid, um, you know, their educational levels, what type of schools are they working in uh, with this. So you can learn about who's educating the students. And finally, one of the record groups that I found interesting in RG12 are records relating to desegregation in education. Now this uh, series primarily consists of information papers and reports about various methods and issues concerning school desegregation. Another primary record group that you can look in would be RG419, which is records of the National Institute of Education. Um, these records were created primarily between, excuse me, primarily between 1960 and 1980. Um, the N NIE kind of provided um, leadership in the conduct and support of scientific inquiry into the educational progress. Um, being in the mid to late 20th century, you see more of a use of electronic records um, to provide statistical data on such things as desegregation, funding for various schools, the demographics of schools, social economical information about the students, and if these schools are within, if these schools are within government compliance. Um, you do have various legislation coming from the federal government and these records will tell you if these schools, excuse me, if these schools are falling within the regulations. Several record groups that I thought was of interest, and again, I'm just picking out a few, are records concerning the national assessment of the educational progress. Again, this series contains primary electronic um, data that looks at race and economics in education across the country. You also have compensatory education study files, which include data on the economic status of students, students' achievement, funding allocations, um, the distribution of Title I funds, student development, administration of education, and other data that kind of looks at the effectiveness of government programs within public schools. Another large record group relating to education is RG441, General Records of the Department of Education. This uh, agency establishes policies for administrator and coordinates most federal assistance to education. It consists of publications, correspondence, 
primary and secondary school uh, surveys that pertain to, uh, pertain to educational research and programming. Um, selected files that, um, selected series within this record group are files relating to historically black colleges and universities, or HBCUs, um, which contains transcripts from HBCU board meetings, annual reports, and even testimonies from students and faculty. You also have grant case files for public television programming. Um, here's a way um, television states such as PBS provides educational programming for children, such shows as Sesame Street, The Electric Company, and 321 Contact can be found within that record group. Now, I've also found, looking for information about black education, that information can be found in record groups that does not necessarily pertain to education. But you have to think of what are you looking for and what was the situation. For example, in record group 60, which is Department of Justice, and even record group 65, which is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, you will find um, case files, litigation case files, or even classification, uh, classified case files relating to certain incidents where there would be a federal investigation. For example, you have in 1962 the case of James Meredith um, and his attempts to integrate the University of Mississippi. There are case files where the, just, uh, the DOJ had to take a role, and federal marshals had to take a role to see him get um, admitted and enrolled into the University of Mississippi. You also will see other case files within these, such as the Little Rock Nine crisis that I'll touch on a little bit later, where you see the federal government having to come in to force integration. Also, um, in some other record groups, you have RG48, records of the Office of the Secretary of the Interior, and RG51, records of the Office of Management and Bureau, they partnered with a lot of HBCUs. So you will see records of studies that they've done, mostly scientific studies, um, between HBCUs and federal agencies. And some of these records can be found in some of the sci more scientific type record groups. All right. So there's various ways that the federal government intervened in black education. One is there are several Supreme Court rulings that had a major impact. The Supreme Court records are held at the um, in RG, excuse me, 267, records of the Supreme Court of the United States, um, that actually have dockets, judgments, transcripts of oral arguments, minutes, letters, and other related materials relating to these cases. A few of these cases um, that relates to black education, you have an 1899 Cummins v. Richmond Board of Education where in Georgia, it was decided to close the black high school in order to open four black elementary schools. Now, the Supreme Court ruled this constitutional because there was other alternatives that the black high school kids could go to. There was a lot of uh, local private institutions that would provide higher education to African Americans. Then you have in 1938, Gaines versus Canada, which was a black student in Missouri, excuse me, who wanted to attend law school at the University of Missouri. Now, most schools at this time were segregated. And so he sued because he wanted to attain a law education. Now, the state of Missouri offered to pay his tuition for an out-of-state school, but he wanted to remain in Missouri. So as a result of the Supreme Court ruling, uh, Lloyd Gaines, um, the state of Missouri had to open a black law school, um, which was located at Lincoln University uh, for that. Related to the uh, Gaines v. Canada case is Sweat v. Painter in 1950, where you also have Herman Sweat, who also wanted to attend law school in Texas. But because of segregation laws, uh, the state of Texas tried to create a black law school. But the Supreme Court ruled that that black law school 
was inadequate to the white law school. And it also did not allow the students to interact with other law students. So we do have the Supreme Court cases with that, or information relating to those. Um, probably the most famous, most well-known case is the Brown v. Board decision in 1954. We do have the documentation um, of the five other cases that led to the Brown v. Board. In 1954, you have the Supreme Court ruling that segregated education is illegal. We also have records on some of the backlash. Um, a lot of southern school, a lot of southern states um, took their time to integrate or they would close their schools and just open private schools, or they would close their schools altogether. Um, various record groups, some of the Justice Department and FBI record groups would have documentation on some of the backlash of the Brown v. Board. We, there was also two other Brown v. Board decisions that we also carry here. And I don't wanna say more recent, because we're talking 40 years, but you also have in 1971, the Supreme Court ruling in Swan v. Charlotte Mecklenburg, excuse me, Board of Education, the Supreme Court ruled that it was okay for areas to use busing as a form of integrating schools, um, as a way to take students from one area and, take, and transport them to another school to create a racial balance, um, where you get to start to get the busing situation. I'll talk about the situation in Boston a little bit later. Then you have the Regents of University of California versus Blake in 1978. This particular case was um, based on a medical student, but the Supreme Court ruled that it was, um, that it allowed race to be considered as a factor in college administration. And again, I think this particular issue is still around, I think University of Michigan might still be fighting the Supreme Court ruling with this. So to backtrack, um, to look at education across the time periods, in the 19th century, after a reconstruction, you do have the Freeman's Bureau coming into the South. The Freeman's Bureau was to provide food, clothing, shelter, medical care, um, assistance to those after the destruction of the Civil War. One of the main things that the Freeman's Bureau was able to do was to provide public education for men, women, and children in the South. So you start to see these Freeman Bureau schools pop up across the South, mostly taught by Northern teachers, but you still have the federal government spending in eight, around 1860s, 1870s, nearly $5 million to establish these schools in the South. You had an enrollment of over 90,000 freedmen in these various classes. With that. Um, most of the schools, again, as I mentioned, were mostly white middle class northerners. And you do have some educated black men and women who are teaching freedmen in basic reading, writing, and through a philosophy of self help and additionally vocational training. Um, the record group 105 um, contains a lot of, well, it's the record group for the Freeman's Bureau, but there are several series within this record group that relates directly to black education. Uh, for example, you have the Register of Expenditures for Freedmen Schools that, um, let me just read this off, monthly school reports, journal of accounts with Freedmen Schools, and account with Freedmen regarding schools. These records contain uh, money transfers to issues with money and funding. They also deal with um, teacher um, supplies, teacher, uh, support within these schools. They also contain information about how these schools are serving the freedmen. Um, various accounts, um, money accounts, you can see the money going through. You also see allocation, how funds are being allocated, how federal funds are being allocated um, through this, uh, through many of the Freedmen's Bureau's records. Um, you also can get a sense of what were the freedmen learning? You know, how did they react to this education um, that was um, provided to them through the freedmen schools? All right. 
Another particular group um, of records that's scattered throughout the National Archives are the relationship between the federal government and historically black colleges and universities. Um, many of these HBCUs were established after the American Civil War, primarily in southern states. Now, there are several located in Pennsylvania and Ohio um, also with this. Congress passed an act, passed several acts, excuse me, um, to create these separate um, institutions uh, for higher learning. As a result, several HBCUs in the late 19th and going into the 20th century received federal funding for research, continuing education, pro education programs, and outreach. Several records um, on this topic, but not limited, I found, again, not necessarily in the educational record groups, but as I mentioned in some of the scientific and study record groups, are records relating to historically black colleges and universities grant research grant programs. Um, this consists of correspondence, publications, and reports from the Center of Human uh, Development Service Grants um, on various studies and the role that you see the federal government working with HBCUs on studies. Primarily, the biggest example is you'll see correspondence with uh, George Washington Carver and agricultural training. Um, his correspondences with various agencies within the federal government on new, improved agricultural techniques. You also have, which I thought was really interesting, in Record Group 255, records of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. Um, you have the series Historically Black Colleges and University Files, um, where you can see where um, students at HBCUs are working with NASA on various programs, writing research grants, and also partic uh, participating in various experiences. Now we also have audio recordings of various conferences, uh, committees, ceremonies, where you do see officials from HBCUs and officials from various uh, federal agencies coming together to discuss um, various types of uh, problems and even new types of research with that. Okay. I like finding unique people. When I see somebody, I like to look more into them. There was two African-American gentlemen who worked for the Department of Education in the um, early to mid 20th century. Uh, one of these men was um, Ambrose Carvier. Uh, he was born 1819, passed in 1962. Uh, he was born in Saltsville, Virginia. He earned various degrees at Knoxville College, University of Wisconsin, and Columbia's Teachers College. Uh, he held many positions as a professor and then eventually dean at Fisk University. Uh, he was also appointed by President Herbert Hoover as the first senior specialist in the education of Negroes in the U.S. Office of Education. Carvier also served under President um, Franklin D. Roosevelt as an advisor in his black cabinet um, relating to various issues of black education and vocational education. Um, he promoted um, awareness in his position on the disparities in education between blacks and whites. He also created a radio program um, called Freedom's People that featured stories about African-American history and black achievements during his role at, um, in the Department of Education. He also, which I found very interesting in this particular role, he traveled across the country taking surveys and documenting the funding failures of public schools. So he was looking at, in various surveys and studies that we have several series on, um, you know, how federal funding was not necessarily being allocated where it needs to be and how some of the students um, were not receiving the uh, resources that they need to excel. A uh, couple of his, um, excuse me, he produced the National Survey of Education of Teachers. Um, this is a six-volume series 
um, that was produced in 1933. Um, the series can be found in the office files of Ambrose Cavier, 1946-62, uh, where you have general correspondence, other surveys, oops, excuse me, um, relating to his findings of actually visiting several um, black schools across the country. And again, he's in a very important role as one as an advisor to um, Franklin Delaval Roosevelt. The other gentleman that I found interesting, he too was in the Office of Education after Carvier, was Walter G. Daniels. Um, he received degrees from Virginia Union University, the University of Cincinnati, and Columbia's University Teachers College. Um, he taught um, at Howard University till 1951 when he accepted a position as specialist in higher education in the Office of Education. Uh, in that role, he wrote um, over 100 books, pamphlets, charters, articles, editorials, and book reviews about federal funding, primarily in HBCUs, but African Americans in higher education. Um, in his series, The Correspondence of Dr. Walter G. Daniel, you will see his inquiries dealing with race relations between students in schools. You also see um, admission, uh, data or statistical reports about the admission rates of African Americans at HBCUs and at predominantly white institutions. Uh, you also see his correspondences with the Federal Security Agency, the Office of Education, and he also, in this role, worked with a lot of non-governmental agencies um, regarding higher educational opportunities for African Americans. How's the time? Okay. Um, so looking at a couple of key events um, to look at how the federal government um, participated in situations that's not necessarily found in record groups relating to education. One such event was the Little Rock Nine crisis. After Brown v. Board in 1954, the South pretty much needed to find ways to integrate their schools. In Little Rock, Arkansas, you have nine students who were selected to integrate Central High School. Uh, these students attempted several times to enter the school. Um, you can see, um, probably seen images of them being harassed, taunted, um, trying to enter the school. This was the first time you will see um, President um, Eisenhower had to send in uh, military to help to escort these students into the school. Several records um, that we do have relating to the Little Rock Nine crisis is you will see the um, address to the American people in the situation in Little Rock. This was a series of radio recordings um, primarily from the president and other leading folks, keeping other Americans updated on what's going on in Little Rock, in the Little Rock crisis. There's several, um, you do have FBI files, um, classification 44, civil rights headquarters case files. Uh, you also have a series called Nine from Little Rock um, that actually won some awards um, that were produced by federal agencies over this uh, situation. I mean, many of these series, you can find series, uh, excuse me, speeches from President Eisenhower. You'll also find letters from everyday individuals who are writing to the federal government, whether it's to the president, whether it's to the DOJ or Congress. Um, some of these are kept in case files of people, you know, just appalled by the situation um, are people who support the efforts of the students. So you get a little of all. There are also the actual videos um, of the students that you can find relating to this Little Rock crisis. Again, as I mentioned, we do hold some documentaries that won awards, um, including the Congressional Gold Medal, and one even won a 1965 Oscar. Okay. Another situation that occurred about 40 years ago uh, was the desegregation of public schools in Boston, Massachusetts. 
1965, the Massachusetts legislator ordered all state public schools to desegregate. So the issue with desegregation wasn't just a Southern thing, it was across the country. Um, this legislation was opposed by many in Boston. So in 1972, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, filed a class action lawsuit in Morgan v. Heineck Hennigan um, against the Boston School Committee alleging that there was segregation in Boston public schools. This lawsuit made it to the U.S. District Court for the District of Massachusetts, which again is a federal agency or federal court, uh, where that there was a pattern of racial discrimination. So in 1974, they were, the public schools in Boston, Massachusetts were ordered to desegregate. Like this. So going back to the Swan v. Charlotte Board of Education, um, Boston decided to use a system of busing. Uh, the records uh, relating to this case are available in, in the National Archives at Boston uh, for this, where you start to see Boston officials begin to start busing black students from the Roxbury neighborhood into South Boston. As a result of this busing issue, you do see residents in South Boston um, behaving very violently, similar to the Little Rock crisis, towards these students um, being bused. They were throwing rotten tomatoes, rocks, whatever they could at these particular buses, um, and even yelling at them. So you do have the uh, case file, uh, and I'm probably mispronouncing this, Talula Morgan versus James W. Honigan, which contains various documents on the decision for the desegregation and also um, the issue with Massachusetts trying to delay or certain school districts trying to delay integration of these public schools. Okay, so in conclusion, um, even today, you do see that the federal government still plays a major role in the education of African Americans, whether it's through federal funding, affirmative action, um, you start to see presidential initiatives. Uh, you also have um, the federal government, again, looking to make sure that schools, school, public school areas are being compliant um, for various issues. Um, but it's still a, a challenge, um, even on the primary, secondary, and higher educational level. Um, but I'm hoping that you know somebody's going to do some groundbreaking research on these records, um, you know, that can really contribute to um, looking at how the federal government plays a role into Black education. So with that, I'm going to say thank you uh, for this brief presentation about the role of federal uh, federal government in Black education. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I appreciate very much your presentation today. I uh, am looking online, and at this time, we do not have any questions from our online audience. Okay. Uh, I invite those of you who are here with us on site to, uh, if you have any questions, please use the microphones in the aisles. And while they're considering any questions that they might have for you, I have a couple of questions. I have oh. actually one question. Uh, I'm also intrigued. You uh, mentioned uh, Mr. Uh, Cavier and mm -hmm. Mr. Daniel and the work that they established. And I was wondering, with the surveys and the work that they did, did they start a baseline of um, reports that carried on that the National Archives has. So uh, you had mentioned uh, the surveys that Cavier had done. Mm -hmm. So did he establish something that we can now find the same kind of survey, you know, for you know, more recently? Thank you. Well, that's almost a trick question. Because uh, <laughs> as you know, we have a lot of records and I've not got my hands on everything. I would almost say yes, there are um, additional surveys from other people. I've not seen them yet. Um, I know there are some in, is it Record Group 441, where, um, which is mostly electronic records, so you do have a lot of surveys or statistical data on um, the income of students, 
the racial makeup of students, the um, type of grades are, um, the types of grades, the types of federal funding the schools get. So there are other um, surveys that you can find in some of these various series um, that were probably headed by an agency. What I found very interesting about Carvier and Daniels was like they took this initiative, it became very personal to them. Um, and during the time, I mean, we're talking 1930s and 1950s, you know, they had the resources and the ability to go out into and actually physically see um, these in, um, institutions to do, conduct these studies uh, with that. There probably are studies now, um, you know, with the um, federal government. I have not seen these records yet. And notice I use the word yet. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I'm look, checking online to see if we have any questions from our online audience. And it looks like at this time we do not. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions from our on-site audience? Well, thank you very much thank for you. your thorough, but although you considered it brief, it was yes. very uh, rich with detail mm -hmm. and you gave us a lot of material. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate okay. your. All right. Your presentation. Thank, well, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesse, no questions. <laughs>